All right. <clears throat> with extraordinary pleasure and honor, I would like to share this session with you in a forum unique to TRB in the transportation profession. A chance to present a story embodying more than 50 years in the making. In being given this rare privilege, I particularly want to thank my mentors, both with us and in spirit, who helped me gain a foothold in the transportation profession and to the many friends I treat as family within the TRB community. I particularly wish to acknowledge the late Herbert Levinson, who was truly the father of this topic and author of the first publication on bus use of highways. Lee Goodman, who was the first to implement a high-speed managed lane in New Jersey. Dennis Christensen and the late Don Capel, who founded the Managed Lanes Committee, performed early research and foresaw the future role occupancy vehicle lanes, or HOV, would play. I also wish to acknowledge the early innovators and adopters and the many chairs, members, and friends of the Standing Committees for Managed Lanes, Freeway Operations, transportation systems management, bus systems, and our other peer committees who continue to move the needle in supporting research and dissemination of best practices. They have all become key members of a growing legacy of this particular profession and of the story that I'm about to tell. This story starts the way it will end, with a vision addressing mobility, simply based on the need we have to get safely and efficiently from point A to point B with minimum friction and stress. Way back in the 1950s, we embraced that vision in a newly proposed interstate highway system. One such illustration, published in the 1950s in a magazine, portrayed succinctly, if not accurately, what that vision could look like. We could whiz down a highway nonstop oblivious to road conditions, perhaps while playing dominoes with the kids. Okay, today maybe it's Minecraft. The vehicle could drive itself. Sound familiar? Seven decades later, we are still hoping that part of the vision will arrive with the latest technologies being proposed and tested. But really, in reality, we are still looking at something more fundamental. Do you see an oversight in this picture? What about the lack of traffic? We are still overwhelmed with demand today, particularly in urban areas, well after this interstate highway system was in the process of being completed. As it turns out, most any transportation historian could have predicted this. Indeed, our cities have been experiencing congestion in almost every mode we have embraced through the ages including horse carts and streetcars. Some parkways and vintage 1930s highways in America were congested almost from the day they opened. Congestion, as it turns out, is synonymous with growth, and so often growth outpaces our resources to provide the necessary infrastructure to support and manage it. Not surprisingly, congestion would quickly become apparent on many of our new urban freeways. While patterned after Europe's motorways, our controlled access highway system was different. Our system was envisioned and largely federally funded to address both interstate highway commerce and defense needs and offer mobility through and within our cities. The latter attribute, not typical in Europe. As urban freeways quickly filled up, widening was undertaken to address growing demand. In the largest and most congested cities, ever more widening responded to and created growth. With limited options, an era of experimentation was about to emerge that would re-envision how to best use some of this pavement and right of way. This approach would start dedicating and managing some of the space to a higher and better use. Route 495, leading into the Lincoln Tunnel in suburban New Jersey, was so old and constrained that it could not be part of the interstate system, which is why it's still officially called a route and not an interstate. 
This artery served as a primary link for New Jersey commuters traveling into Manhattan. Each day, bus laden passengers sat in stop and go conditions, wasting a half hour as traffic crawled toward a toll plaza and drivers fought a game of chicken to merge and enter tunnels under the Hudson River. Port Authority of New York and New Jersey operations staff who managed the tunnel and toll plaza had witnessed this spectacle every morning for years. Bus demand alongside other public transport demand from New Jersey had steadily grown. Blasting out more granite to widen Route 495 and build more tunnels was impractical. Given limited options, a daring risk-laden strategy was proposed. Since outbound morning traffic was light, a method was explored to allow inbound buses to borrow and use one of the outbound lanes. This $500,000 proposal involved great risk, but also great rewards. The Port Authority had a built-in safety benefit of having dedicated operations personnel co-located with enforcement staff on site at the tunnel. The idea was approved on a demonstration basis. The staff employed a variety of traffic control devices, pavement pylons, overhead signs, and lane controls to communicate when the lane operated in the opposing direction. The resulting operation moved an astounding 34,000 commuters per hour, saving each passenger between 10 and 25 minutes. It remains one of the most heavily used and cost-effective bus lanes in the world. Let's examine the daily risk they faced. Oncoming traffic meant every bus driver was navigating an uncompromising path where even the placement of side mirrors is restricted. Reduced speeds were enforced. A dedicated staff were on standby for any incident with heavy duty tow vehicles to address blockages. But this solution worked and has for over a quarter century. Similar experiments followed copying this contraflow approach. A lane was borrowed on the Southeast Expressway in Boston to expedite bus operations during the summer months in the early 1970s. A demonstration on the Golden Gate Bridge helped afternoon bus commuters on a borrowed inbound lane. A morning contraflow lane was started on Long Island on the Queens Expressway leading to the Queens Midtown Tunnel, initially employing pylons to separate directions. They eventually adopted movable concrete barrier technology to protect opposing traffic and improve safety. The longest such experiment was managed by this speaker on a freeway in Houston. Spanning almost 10 miles, our newly created transit agency partnered with the State Highway Department to test whether a bustling Sunbelt city without any express bus service would be able to attract auto addicted commuters by giving them a faster trip on one of the region's most congested highways. A $1.8 million federal transit grant was secured in 1977 for a contraflow lane that would operate in both commute periods on borrowed pavement. The project's success would be daunting to achieve. Agreement terms addressed who was responsible for removing the improvements if the experiment failed. Remote parking lots were leased along with contracted buses and maintenance facilities, dedicated employment Deployment vehicles were purchased and crews were hired and trained, along with police on contract overtime. Recalling our first August morning in 1970, I guess it was 1979, I arrived on site at 3 a.m. with deployment crews as we followed our practice routine. The only emotion a crackling through our two way radios was who would be responsible to address the media if something serious happened. Fast moving traffic passing our convoy seemed far more threatening than all the other imagined hazards of closing an active lane and exposing buses to oncoming traffic. 
Within a matter of months, we were moving over 16,000 daily commuters in buses and authorized van pools. Fortunately, the feared safety hazards never materialized. As these experiments show, testing these demonstrations were not typically developed without the need for champions and champions are grown often from the ground up, not necessarily getting guidance from a master plan coming from on high. Early examples share a common history. All at some point needed a framework of what comes next if they succeed with close monitoring, supporting programs and learned practice serving as guidance. Meanwhile in Los Angeles, a high-speed busway with stations was built along and within the San Bernardino Freeway. The project mirrored guidance found in NCHRP publication number 155 called Bus Use of Highways, Planning and Design Guidelines that was authored by Herbert Levinson. This seminal research provided an inventory of many bus lane treatments on local streets and laid the groundwork for managed lane designs we see today. It pushed the envelopes for envisioning high capacity bus transit facilities on urban freeways. Regretfully, few examples existed outside the one I just mentioned in Los Angeles. Much of the urban interstate system had been planned or developed by 1976 when these guidelines were published. Incorporating broad spatial footprints for transit facilities was difficult and expensive to accommodate. For these and other reasons, few locations adopted this early guidance into practice. Modest projects serving high capacity vehicle facilities, including treatments for buses, van pools, and carpools began to appear in a number of cities, including Seattle, Miami, Minneapolis, Los Angeles, Orange County, Denver, Houston, San Francisco, Hartford, Portland, Oregon, and Virginia. They were separated from general purpose lanes by either distinguishable diamond pavement markings or physical barriers. Access was either restricted to designated locations or the projects allowed for open weaving. None were implemented as part of a long range plan. Projects were largely tests to determine if added dedicated lanes would provide and result in modal shifts from single occupant vehicles, thereby sustaining capacity for more people in fewer vehicles on the freeways. The Banfield Freeway in Portland, Oregon lasted only a few years until the freeway was rebuilt. Most other demonstrations evolved and were expanded into projects or systems we have today. One project in Santa Monica on the Santa Monica Freeway, Los Angeles, converted an existing heavily used and a lane that was out there, again, on a freeway that you see here, that's eight lanes wide. They took one lane in each direction away and they restricted these lanes for occupant, three or three or more occupant vehicles or three plus carpools as we call them creating adverse impacts and causing a public backlash because so few vehicles qualified. Resulting congestion jammed the corridor. While the project eventually succeeded in moving more people in fewer vehicles, it had lost critical public support and was terminated after 16 weeks by court order. The project's genesis was in response to mandatory air quality restrictions being imposed on the Los Angeles basin at the time. So lane conversion was the only short-term option. Lesson learned, never let policies alone drive a project if it is not founded on common sense expectations of anticipated impacts, which are widely understood and supported. Outreach and education has become an essential element of every project since. The first of several paradigm shifts was about to take place. The initial philosophy of the time of build it and they will come was beginning to be rethought. Funding for widening and associated environmental and social impact was limiting how much pavement could be added to our freeways. An emerging consensus addressing capacity 
became, we can't build our way out of this. Planning for early success, on the other hand, was not always adequately considered. More parking spaces, buses, and expansion plans were quickly required on our Houston Contraflow project, along with the need of eventually replacing it since borrowing a lane was creating its own congestion and no longer sustainable. Houston's first project would have been terminated if it were not replaced in some form. We chose to save our experiment by converting the inside freeway shoulders into a reversible lane separated by barriers at much higher cost. The lane could only serve one direction of travel each commute period, but it was an appropriate compromise. Close monitoring of impacts dedicated lanes were making was proof of concept. Sharing performance results often at TRB meetings was critical to further adoption and testing of operational practice. A federal policy shift encouraged consideration of HOV lanes on projects built with federal funding. A policy directive in 1988 allowed occupancy requirements to be lowered to two or more persons per vehicle. This latitude meant that more projects would pencil out as having significant opportunity to meet initial demand expectations for moving more people than if a conventional lane were added thus avoiding what came to be called empty lane syndrome from a, when a project first opened. One Federal Highway Administration or FHWA office in California encouraged the California Department of Transportation, Caltrans, to consider an HOV lane alternative if conventional widening projects were built in such a fashion that they found that the lane would fill up with HOV vehicles and move more people better than a general purpose lane within five years of opening. As an early adopter, Caltrans responded with a policy and procedures memorandum in 1989 affirming this approach. Federal policies further encouraged HOV lane consideration in the Interstate Surface Transportation Efficiency Act of 1991 which was enacted near the conclusion of the interstate highway building era. By the late 1980s, 125 lane miles of HOV facilities operated on freeways in eight US cities. Multiple projects within a given urban area were beginning to appear. Mileage was doubling every five to seven years. Projects could be found by 1990 in 11 metropolitan areas. About half operated part-time in peak periods, others operated continuously. Expansive public agency partnerships, including FHWA, the Federal Transit Administration, respective state DOTs, transit agencies, and regional transportation and mobility authorities were common. These partnerships between multiple public agencies, which I'll term P2s, not only brought unique implementation perspectives, but also financial resources and broader sponsorship. Of about 80 projects built between 1970 and 1990, few were terminated. Similar projects started to appear in Canada, Spain, and the Netherlands. More traditional top-down planning for HOV lane networks was taking hold, founded on earlier demonstrations and a track record of performance experience. In parallel with an increasing number of projects, implementation and operational guidance also began documenting standards of practice. The first such guidance included a privately sponsored publication I authored and a brief guide by the American Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials, or AASHTO, in the late 1980s. These were followed by research and updated guidance by NCHRP, AASHTO, FHWA, the Institute of Transportation Engineers, and a handful of state DOTs, including California, Washington, and Texas. Such guidance continues to be periodically updated with the latest NCHRP 835 publication, which you see on the right here, called Guidelines for Implementing Managed Lanes. 
Each successive publication has built on an ever broadening array of projects, funded research, and best practices. FHWA maintains an ongoing partnership involving pool funds research with state and local agencies addressing managed land issues of mutual benefit. The congestion pricing era became the next inflection point in the early 1990s. <clears throat> managed land plans were greatly outpacing available funding with an ever widening unfunded gap approaching 5 billion a desire to improve management and serve a wider range of travelers was also being sought. Congestion pricing using electronic transponders mounted in vehicles helped address this need. A policy change sponsored by FHWA in 1991 encouraged demonstrations through a congestion and value pricing pilot program which had a big impact on rethinking how demand could be managed beyond occupancy eligibility alone. A wide number of pricing demonstrations on new and converted projects occurred over the following 17 years. Congestion pricing was added to existing HOV projects in six locations. To address funding shortfalls, California passed legislation and sought proposals from private consortiums to implement and operate any potential new highway project these public-private partnerships, called P3s, allowed a unique opportunity for leasing new roadways to concessions with tolls collected to cover costs. One winning candidate was an eight-mile four-lane project along State Route 91 between Orange and Riverside counties, a notoriously congested link in the region's freeway system. In keeping with local and state policies, the project provided account holding carpools free or discounted use and priced others. Express lanes were able to be largely funded from private sources under a comprehensive development lease agreement. The project was considered a success with the caveat that such agreements needed to include the impacts that jurisdictions would have and not limit future roadway investments and these were addressed in a subsequent change in how the project evolved. While the concession was eventually purchased by the Orange County Transportation Authority, it provided a blueprint for how congestion pricing, funding flexibility, innovative project delivery, and private concessions could pave the way for implementing large-scale projects. Texas, North Carolina, Colorado, Georgia, Florida, Maryland, and Virginia now have managed lanes being implemented or operated by P3 concessions. Federal Transportation Infrastructure and Innovation Act, or TIFIA, a contingent loan program in 1998 also played a role in helping finance multi-billion dollar programs and these investments have increasingly found resonance because they cover projects that otherwise could not be built. Some of these projects were funded in part by toll and mobility authorities, which were either state, county, or regional agencies, including metropolitan planning organizations with authority to implement managed lanes. Most such projects generate revenue only when congestion exists, so they may only cover a portion of their costs. Even P3 concessions may require conventional funding as a part of this investment mix. Some projects like SR91 express lanes generate excess revenue sufficient to fund other transportation projects in the quarter or region. Federal urban partnership agreements and congestion reduction demonstration pro programs have provided matching funds for innovative congestion pricing approaches. Winning proposals were implemented in Miami, Minneapolis, Seattle, Atlanta, and Los Angeles, represented by these illustrations that you see. The Los Angeles project re-envisioned the prior I-110 and 10 HOV lanes with expanded capacity, congestion pricing, new express bus services, and the first equity program for disadvantaged commuters. 
adopting switchable toll transponder technology allowed tiered pricing among different occupant carpools and other travelers. At present, the most popular ways to manage dedicated lanes is through access, occupancy eligibility, and pricing. Some projects also integrate these tools with active traffic management technology, addressing the entire freeway or corridor. Projects often apply these operational principles in combination to address specific needs and types of demand. In 2010, over 2,500 miles of managed lanes operated in 44 cities in the US and Canada. Large scale projects involving two and three bi directional lanes were taking form. Major investments in managed lanes included direct freeway connectors, transit stations, and local access ramps, along with active traffic management strategies. The scale of investment and sponsorship grew commensurately with many variations of local, state, and federal partnerships supporting tolled express lane treatments. Congestion information provided by the Texas A&M Transportation Institute in 2019 shows a greater need than ever for viable mobility options. Almost a quarter of the vehicle miles driven in urban areas occur in congestion. More than 13% of the nation's urban roadways are congested each day, typically for three to five hours. Today, over 4,700 lane miles of different types of managed lanes operate in 150 locations in the US on different freeways. Mileage has almost doubled over the past decade. About 40% of this mileage includes electronic pricing as part of a management strategy. The balance operates with HOV restrictions alone. Still, these projects are quite limited in terms of coverage. Only a small fraction of America's urban highway system offers a managed lane option in some form. Looking forward and re-envisioning our managed lanes legacy, what has been learned over the past 50 years in our history and what lies ahead if we look forward in the same time frame? Well, first off, we have learned many things that have helped guide us through these many years. We have learned that most demonstrations in each era involve federal funding, contributions, and incentives to test new strategies. Transit and carpooling incentives positive in, positively influenced modal shifts. Higher occupancy vehicles serve more demand in fewer vehicles, thereby providing a more sustainable outcome. Pricing has promoted benefits to a larger population of travelers and helped capital intensive projects become financially feasible. Each day, several million people save thousands of hours and gain productivity. Freeways with managed lanes experience a 12 to 22% reduction in total delay. Dedicated lane treatments are an integral, although modest component in promoting mobility choice in congested urban areas and are only part of an overall treatment in freeway operation and transit services. Multiple investments in different modes are often needed since travel markets seldom overlap. Yet managed lanes are considered by some as lacking and not necessarily meeting their potential or stated goals. If we promote benefits to all motorists, does this detract from carpool and transit incentives? Does monetizing dedicated lanes primarily benefit higher occupancy travelers disproportionately? Will mass adoption of electric vehicles minimize original air quality goals supporting HOV investments? Since we only serve a small portion of total demand, are we really providing a meaningful and safe option of choice to travelers? How do we best address violators who routinely consume available and precious managed lane capacity? How have commuter behavior changes accelerated by COVID-19 affected carpool and transit markets? And how do we sustain the efficacy of managed lanes against adverse policies 
such as a vehicle miles of travel cap on new projects in California or anti-toll sentiment in Texas. Similar challenges have been present and addressed by practitioners over these past 50 years. They have been charged with our roadway investments and operations. So such challenges are not new. Experience shows project sponsors must and should challenge their own practices and test the status quo or be subjected to an incremental loss of credibility and purpose by such external influences. I'll offer one example. When Caltrans engineering staff in a post interstate building culture complained about having to consider HOV lanes rather than build real capacity, David Roper, the operations branch chief at the time, reminded them that they were being challenged to do more with less and not assume the same approach would always be accepted. Challenges pose the greatest potential opportunity for us to reimagine what form roadway management may take. Ahead, we could test and embrace strategies to support a broader array of modes, equity, and climate considerations. Managed lanes remain unique among most highways in America for the very reason that they preserve some capacity in perpetuity and are actively managed. Members and friends of the TRB Standing Committee on Managed Lanes were asked to explore prior to this lecture what potential near and longer term perspectives they foresee. These are some of our collective thoughts. More systems and more intelligence. We will likely see more regional connectivity with fewer gaps in existing dedicated lane networks, perhaps shifting pricing policies toward mileage-based user fees without the need for toll gantries, complicated rules, and extensive signing. Managed lanes, indeed our entire transportation system, will need to have more intelligence built into them for safer and more efficient travel. Equity and outreach. Today and tomorrow, we are likely to see commuters that will not remember what we did over the past 50 years. This will mean that as a part of that, uh, the need to educate and inform these people, that we'll need to understand and explain to them that in fact, the capacity that's there is there to benefit all travelers, not just reduce the demand for a selected few. Even those who do understand have a hard time explaining high tolls and the need to better explain those tolls to the general population. There is also a very difficult barrier in trying to explain high tolls on some facilities at certain times of the day. Communicating the true cost of driving and why the value of the trip is high when demand is high is a hard concept to communicate. Equity programs could be employed as a tool to support additional mobility options for underserved and impacted communities to counteract the term used by some as Lexus lanes. Engaging in high tech and high touch outreach will always be needed. There's an app for that. More and more trip making is relying on smart device applications that provide real time choices and opportunities allowing for faster and more reliable trip making. But much of the invested managed lane technology, including tolling, is not ready for this leap. Too much complexity and rules and operational policies exist in many locales. While project restrictions vary, greater continuity and simplicity the customer interface will be required. Continuity is necessary to provide for a means to engage the emerging technologies associated with smarter trip making that will be tested in the evolving role that managed lanes will play. Changes in commute characteristics. Recent pandemic impacts have accelerated telework. Its effects on commute trips to major employment centers has shifted demand, revenue, and transit dynamics. We are not sure how this shift affects the longer term. Urban traffic is basically back 
that destinations and patterns have changed. Couple these with changes together in a different context may exist for managed lanes and commuter oriented carpool and transit services. Prepare for autonomy. At long last, we are seeing freight moving autonomously. For separate roadway systems, there is every reason to expect that autonomous technology already built into cars and trucks will eventually find its way into business rules. Manage lanes will ultimately need to accommodate or champion technology-centric vehicles and policies. And finally, a more holistic approach. Lane management is becoming more broad reaching, not limited to a subset of users and lanes as we currently know them. Recent expansion into multi-lane roadways is testament to this trend. Some practitioners believe the current approach to dedicated lanes may be too simplistic and too limited. Parallel roadways can increase capacity by reducing the impacts of weaving on ever wider cross sections and perhaps could achieve even better increases if all lanes were managed. In this context, could we be on the cusp of dedicating general purpose lanes to be better managed in a parallel universe or instead moving toward managed freeways such that duplicate strategies are redundant? As participants of this lecture, you're a witness to the legacy of how mobility was re-envisioned many years ago on our urban freeways, the use of managed lanes. We are undoubtedly at another evolution now peering at us into the future with many possibilities. The current lexicon, even the term managed lane, generated by its namesake TRB committee and adopted nationwide has evolved many times since the 1970s. Will we see vehicle autonomy and artificial intelligence become our latest mobility tools to employ? Will that future merely see the managed lane systems completed and improved or morphed into strategies that address all travelers or perhaps applied outside urban settings as autonomous or commercial vehicle roadways? Why does all this matter? The next 50 years of managed lane practice, or whatever it's called, will undoubtedly evolve as differently as the first 50. I encourage our current generation of practitioners representing all transportation modes to reassess where you stand and confront your challenges. Be prepared to take prudent risks, test new approaches, improve customer interface, document findings, promote research, share experiences, and create greater sustainability in practice when addressing the many challenges and opportunities that lie ahead. Thank you for attending this lecture and thank you for being a participant in the 102nd TRB Annual Meeting.